The original idea was that there was kind of like pretty much the same bad guy like in Wild Wild West, the movie, so this crazy general. And he was trying to build an army of zombies. Why are you called me, me, me games? Because we cry all the time. So even until today, if you would take the intro of Desperados and would put the Bon Jovi song under it, it just feels perfectly in the, in the beginning if you just see the rails and the song starts. Compared to other games at that time, they were like super cinematic and deep storytelling, deep storylines, and it was like mind blowing when you played them. Sometimes was very kind of like, yeah, can you take out all, all, all more or less the, the strategy elements and make it more an adventure game? And we were like, kind of, like, no, this is not the game we're, we're going to do. The Desperado series is turning 20. To celebrate the birthday, we've talked with Ralf Adam, producer of Desperados Wanted Dead or Alive, and Dominic Abe of Mimimi Games, designer for Desperados 3, about inspiration, failings, learnings, and how to successfully revive a genre and a franchise. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about where Desperados came from. Do you remember what the first idea was, what kind of the first pitch was, what kind of game this would become? Yeah, um, so back at that time I was working uh, for Infogram, um, um, which was one of the biggest uh, publishers back in the day, so that was the late 90s, 99, um, to be precise, and I was there in a strategy label, which they had just founded. Um, so we were out looking for new strategy uh, strategy titles we could sign, or tactic games, anything in that genre. Um, and I actually stumbled upon a screenshot in the PC Games, which was a big magazine, big German magazine back in the days, that had uh, one screenshot of the game and it said uh, Spellbound, the uh, creators of the Gianna Sisters series and their uh, studio had uh, Armin Gessert are working on a new game and they just gave us this exclusive screenshot. And we were kind of like intrigued, especially um, I was at Infogram, which was a company based in Lyon, but I was in the German office. And obviously I was aware of that uh, Spellbound was also a German company. So I just picked up the phone uh, because I knew Armin, the, the CEO um, of that uh, studio, and just called him and say, hey, I, I read here in the PC games that you're working on a new title and this is looking great. And it seems to be something around a tactic strategy game. And we're looking for these kind of, of games, actually. Would you be up to, to talk with us about it? And so that was actually the start. So I drove down with my boss uh, to Kehl, just close to Strasbourg. So it's at the uh, French border, so still in Germany, but close to the French border, to the Alsace. And well, we, we paid the studio a visit and they showed us the very early prototype and it just looked fantastic. And we were kind of like, okay, we need to get this title no matter what. And we started negotiating. And if you get confused because if you have the game at home and look at it and it says Atari, that was still Infogram. So Infogram bought the Atari brand as well, uh, amongst many other things, and just renamed themselves into Atari, but it was still Infogram. So it was Info uh, for a while it was Atari slash Infogram and later it was just Atari. I'm, I'm confused myself what it was at that time. The developers at Spellbound had already made the name with the Super Mario inspired Jana sisters. Jean-Marc Hessig is still creative director at the studio today, although they've renamed themselves to Black Forest Games to honor their home. Back then, Jean-Marc had already channeled his love for the science fiction genre into a Perry Roden game, based on a still ongoing series of novellas that might lack international fame, but have been called Germany's Star Trek. Science fiction wasn't his only love, though. He was a big fan of a series which was not that well known in Germany. It was well known in France and also I think in the United States. It was called Wild Wild West. It became later famous again because there was this movie with Will Smith. Um, they made a, a movie out of it. But originally that was a series from the 70s, I think. And he was a big fan of that. That was one of his main source of inspiration. Then obviously the Sergio Leone and all the classic spaghetti western. But also he had another kind of um, um, insp source of inspiration because he's French. So he works in Germany, but he lives in Strasbourg and he's a, uh, originally an artist. Uh, so he was creative director, but his roots are in, in drawing and, and painting. And he's a big fan also of a guy called 
called Möbius, who did mm. very classic Western um, kind of like uh, cartoons, like the Marvels, but in a Western setting. So those were his main sources of inspiration for the original game. And from a, from a game perspective, I mean, obviously all kind of like tactic games. I mean, there are roots of, of, of some Metal Gear Solid is in that game. Obviously, the biggest game we've always got compared to, and I mean, rightfully as well was the commando series which came out before us from pyro studios in spain um, and that was also of course a game we played a lot and where we took some inspiration out and tried to, to to take over what we liked in that game but make it a different give it a different style make it more cineastic and and everything that is desperados now and looking back do you remember what that first first prototype looked like and, and the things that changed? I, I still have it. I don't know which level exactly. I guess the fans out there will know it because for me it's 20 years ago and I played the game a couple of times afterwards again but I forgot which exact level it is but it's in the second part of the game must be level if I guess it would be 16, 17 but there is a scenario where the gang comes into the town uh, with a train And then they leave the train and enter the train station. And right when you start the level, there are, I think, five, six bad guys in front of you and, and you have your gang and you need to get out of this situation by kind of like with this quick action function that you have a program that everybody shoots down one of the other opponents. So that's kind of like a shootout scene right at the beginning of the of the of of this level. And it's obviously um, a kind of like um, reminiscence to... Um, the famous train scene in uh, Once Upon a Time in the West mm -hmm. um, with Charles Bronson. And that level, actually, or that scene, they already had in the prototype. It wasn't as polished, um, but it already showed the final art to a certain extent. I mean, there were a lot of props and everything that make the level even more detailed and, and, and more lively. All, those, all of these things were still missing, but it already had the final train, the final train station, and this kind of like scene. That was the very first thing they had. And they only had this one action that you could shoot. So all the other actions that you can make in the game weren't in that prototype yet. But just that, just that scene, A, it transported so much of this Western feeling already and what they tried to achieve with the game or what what they achieved with the game um, Spellbound. And B, it already has had this, uh, what we call in game development, the pacing. So it had the right kind of like timing when you were programming the action and the animation and everything was already very smooth. So just with that very small prototype or that, that very small part of that level, it already showed what the game could, could become. And we were kind of like, we want that. Almost 20 years after Desperados, wanted dead or alive, the young development studio of Mimi Me Games revived the franchise. Why are you called Mimi Me Games? Because we cry all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Is it such a hard job to be a developer? Yeah. And my colleague founder, Johannes, he was like, you guys are always like Mimi Me Me-ing, like crying about stuff. And then we were like, haha, let's have this as a, as a team name. And then it just have been stuck since then where it contradicts a lot to the games we're doing right now but that's also fun so i don't know it's not where you would expect hardcore tactical games let's first talk about how it came to be that you worked on desperados 3 basically we were always yeah always like following what commanders on desperado was doing and they were not doing much or like anything at all and but we had always an eye out for if somebody would work on them if there would be a possibility to work on them because we liked them so much so even before we started shadow tactics or something we kind of checked some information and then there was this ip transfer to thq and then it popped out okay they are now buying that ip and obviously they want at some point do something with it so we yeah pretty early even during uh, like uh, development of shadow tactics we approached them and asked them if they would possibly want to do at some point something with us and it was not on their highest priority list because the genre at that point was that but when shadow tactics came out it very fast came clear that there is potential in that genre and also that we would be now the perfect fit because we already worked so much with that genre would, which nobody else did at that time so i think that made it a very clear fit for them to work with us on the ip and for for me personally it was like yeah 
that is one of my dreams because that those like Commandos and Desperados were always the games that influ influenced me the most. So it was like a no brainer. So I don't know. <laughs> Compared to other games at that time, they were like super cinematic and deep storytelling, deep storylines. And it was like mind blowing when you played them back then. So in that spirit, we really wanted to keep and also it was quite clear that we wanted to make a prequel because we would not want anybody to require knowledge to like get back into that ip and that was also so much potential in like oh they have those cool characters but they never told like how they met so that was pretty cool to be allowed and able to like tell that part of the story of the universe that was super fun Let's talk a little bit about about the setting. If I remember correctly, it was um, supposed to be weirder, so yes. yeah. with with supernatural elements in the yeah. beginning. And that goes also what I've learned then back uh, later from Jean Marc. It, that goes back to this one source I've mentioned before, which was Wild Wild West. I mean, also in the in the movie with, with with Will Smith. I mean, most people may have not seen the series, but I think the movie is still kind of like um, present. Um, there is, you know, this guy without the legs, but he's sitting in this kind of like spider wheelchair. And there are all sorts of weird mechanic things and stuff like that. And that was something they also wanted in their game. So, and it would go even one step further. So the original idea was that there was kind of like pretty much the same bad guy like in Wild Wild West, the movie, so this crazy general. And he was trying to build an army of zombies. So he was creating zombies. Uh, and I don't, don't remember whether those who had some roots to the more supernatural with voodoo or if it was something more mechanical, but at least he was supposed to build up a zombie army. And that's why also one of the characters Mia was in the game because originally the plan was to give her a katana sword so she would have been the only one who would have been able to kill the zombies and we were kind of like I mean we loved this fantastic western scenario and everything but in any case we were kind of like mm, this blending of these kind of like two genres uh, we're not too convinced what about if we maybe just turn it into a pure real spaghetti western so instead of going full crazy go more into clint eastwood style um and they liked it i mean they, they were kind of like they had still some doubts on their end as well whether the, the, the zombie idea this mixture would have been a good idea or not and our proposal was actually look guys what we can do is we make it a serious western game the game it is now well serious it also has some humorous aspects obviously but more on on the light-hearted side not on the crazy side and we said if it goes really well uh we may start some spin-offs and maybe then we can explore some more crazy territory so maybe in the future do an add-on with some zombies or something like that and they were no oh, that's cool that's a cool idea and let's just do that also back in that uh, during that time the game had still the working title death valley also kind of like a, a bit more moving into the direction of this whole zombie aspect, which in the, in the end it didn't have. I have to ask then, when you were working on that, did you know that in Desperados 1 they actually had planned to have more of these weirder elements of, of magic and mechanics and zombies in there? Okay, you did know. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that story, uh, Ralph, I think totals, I don't know, maybe even five years ago or something like even on. I think for Shadow Tactics, we already knew that. So <laughs> that was also one reason why we were like, okay, they had already ideas like that. They wanted to make it more crazy. And so we also thought then that's another like reason maybe why we can have that in it. Do you remember when the decision was made to, to call mm. the game Desperados and why? Yeah. So the... Um, hmm. We signed the game late 99, must have been something like October, November. It came out in, well, April 2001. I think that's also one of the reasons for this interview because we're celebrating pretty much by today the 20th um, release date. Um, and I think we the, the zombie decision was already when we were still in a contract negotiation. So we told them, look guys, we don't want to sign a contract now and then later say you need to change the story. Uh, that would be bad publisher behavior, but we want to We want you to be aware that we want to sign the game, but only if we can turn it into a full Western game. And they say, no, that's fine. That that's okay. And we signed a contract within one month, I think. So it was all really fast. And so we still lived with Death Valley for a while, I think, maybe another 
four or five months. Uh, we were kind of, yeah, it's a cool title. I mean, it still fits for Western, even if it's without zombies, we may, may, may leave it or not. Uh, but then ultimately we said, um, no, maybe let's change it. And then we were looking for a new name. The team would have loved to use the name Desperados, but there was one tiny problem. There already was a game called Desperados, a budget shooter by GT Interactive. Spellbound told us we, we can't use the name. But the funny thing is, um, exactly at that time, Infogram was on a, on a buying spree, so they had a lot of money, and they bought Ocean, which was a huge English um, publisher, developer, and they also bought actually GT Interactive in the United States. And GT Interactive had the rights for this Desperados game that was sold at Walmart. Um, so we actually, with that, had the rights name, and We're, we're sure nobody could sue us uh, if we use this name again for for a, a, a bigger title. Uh, and so we just decided, okay, we take Desperados, we just need a subtitle. And then I think it was me who came up with the subtitle Wanted Dead or Alive, which again was kind of like the idea came from another source of inspiration, and that was the Bon Jovi song. Because at that time we were already working on the cutscenes, um, because Desperados has a lot of cutscenes, and part of the the unique selling point, at least back in those days, was we wanted to give it a big entry with the large um, intro. But then also after each level, as some kind of a reward, we would also show another cutscene and tell the story even further with high res rendered cutscene, uh, which would be these back in 20 years ago. I mean, these days you do it in. in in engine but back then that was really a big thing and for the intro we already had kind of like a lot of the the cinematics and just for fun i always uh, put uh, as we didn't have any music back then yet i always put um, wanted dead or alive the, the song from bon jovi under it and it was fitting perfectly so even until today if you would take the intro of desperados and would put the bon jovi song under it it just feels perfectly in the, in the beginning if you just see the rails and the song starts and goes to the first climb it's perfect and that went that far that we actually asked Bon Jovi or I mean our marketing department in France uh, reached out to their managers but uh, they wanted uh, one million flat for the buyout for just this one song and I mean the game was less than a million back in the day so yeah it was too expensive unfortunately looking back at where the game came from initially um, what do you think about that that supernatural elements made it back into the setting is the kind of fulfillment of the promise that you made back then yeah i i mean i definitely love it they did it in the third part i i, I still i even for an add-on if it would have been zombies at least the zombies they had in mind because again what what um, spellbound had in mind was really more zombies like you know from george r romero mixed with mm -hmm. wild wild west um and you could say in the desperados three um The, the, the voodoo lady also turns the opponents into kind of like zombies but this is really the, the original kind of like zombies and it fits the setting so perfectly with this New Orleans setting and this whole voodoo aspect so it, it, it really it's, it's perfectly embedded and I like it much better now the way it is than what we originally had in mind um, so yeah Many players first contact with the Desperados game was through a demo that was distributed in cereal boxes of all things yeah. something that keeps coming back is that many people their first contact with the game was actually in a cereal box yes <laughs> how did um, that happen the marketing that was all more handled in france and headquarter because they had a big marketing department there um so they actually made that deal um and it's funny because a lot of people Up, up until today you know reach out to me and say oh do you remember the cereal box and it was so fantastic and i was like kind of yeah i wish i could claim i had the idea for that but <laughs> that wasn't me i mean the demo itself was great in a way that we also did something that was we were not the only ones but it was still very unique uh, we made a demo level that was not part of the original game because that what what's what most developers and publishers did back in the days they took one level out of the game and made it a demo level but we actually created just for the demo uh, a, a completely new level that was telling kind of like a, a little prequel to the actual desperado stories so it's just a, a day in the life of john cooper and his gang when they're out for you know um, bounty hunting um and that was very unique and also i mean the thing is we did that level very late 
So, I mean, if you start making a game and if you build the first levels, you first have, have to get into it. You try out a lot of things, you thrash a lot of things, you redo levels until you really fully understand how all your game mechanics works best together in the game. And so we, when we made the, the, the demo level, we had a complete understanding of, of the game mechanics and how we could build a great level together. So in my opinion, the demo level is one of the best levels because all of our learnings that we made the past year before that went into that level, obviously. Tell me a little bit about how the game also in, in some places, as far as I know, had to be changed for, for an international release. Because, yeah. as you said, the sources um, that Spellbound was working on were very European, like basically the spaghetti westerns, yeah. um, French comics, things like that. So now if you want to sell this game to people from the USA... Yeah. <laughs> Basically give them this European version of their Western setting. <laughs> um, it was very funny. <laughs> Um, I remember uh, we were out uh, at E3, uh, the big show, um, back in the days to demo your games in the United States, in Los Angeles, um, in the convention center. And we were uh, demoing the game to um, American press. And the first question they asked us is, uh, you guys are from Europe, how, do you, how dare you, more or less, to, to make a Western, which is kind of like our native genre here in the United States. Uh, and then you make this kind of like spaghetti Western and it looks so Sergio Leone and this is all ours. And we were like, do you know why these Westerns were called spaghetti Westerns? And the journalists were looking at us and we were like, they were all shot down in Italy. And they're, no, you're lying. You're lying. This is not true. And we, <laughs> they were not believing us that actually most of the Sergio Leone Westerns were shot down in Italy or in Spain and, and other European places. And so they were so completely under the impression this is so United States in its roots, which it is with regards to the story, obviously, and everything it is there. But especially the Western, we tried to, to transport and to, to cover and, and kind of like to remake it to a game where actually more European thing, at least from where they were shot and everything. So that was very funny. Um, I mean, there were a couple of things with regards to that. Um, Uh, the cover, for example, I don't know if you've ever seen the United States cover box. It looks completely different than the European ones. Um, it's, I mean, the, 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 the European ones uh, shows the, I think it shows John Cooper, uh, Kate, and who's the third one? I would even need to look, Doc, I think. Uh, so the three uh, main heroes um, in close-ups, in the rendered style, like they're at least in the cutscene, and below there is, um, I think, another scene from the game from the cutscenes. And the um, US cover showed all heroes, which I kind of liked, but they were all drawn and looked more like cartoons, mm -hmm. um, which still for me until today, if I look at the box, it, it looks weird to me, but I mean, I've, I was used to it that um, U.S. boxes always look completely different to, to um, European boxes. What I also loved about the U.S. boxes, they sold it in a big box, not in a DVD case, which I like better. Uh, so that was one of the things. Another thing which I think is hilarious, um, in Europe, we obviously had with the theme of the game and what, what you're doing, um, had some age rating issues. So we were always kind of like struggling. Okay, how far can we go with the violence and what can we show and blood and everything. And we ended up with a 12 rating, which was the, the thing we, we wanted to achieve. But we definitely had to turn down some of the violence. And for the US version, they asked us to put in more blood, but we were supposed to take out all the curse uh, and swearing. So in, 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 in the German version or the European version, Doc is always kind of like, uh, like shit, I'm too old for this shit. And this kind of like, and this is all not in the US version. So they had to take out all the curse words, for example, which called, was a bit weird. And then we also had the famous uh, scene in, um, at the farm in the second level. Uh, this cotton farm, uh, which is, I mean, today, if you look at Django Unchained, it's pretty much the same, only that also we had to tame it down with, with regards to um, that there are ladies, if you look closely, it, walking through the cotton fields, serving lemonade to all the workers there to make it very kind of like worker-friendly environment. Um, so those were some of the changes we actually had to do for, for the international version. But for me, the, the, big, the, the biggest kind of like laugh was still when they said no we want more violence but less of the curse words and i was like hmm, okay <laughs> for Europe, that's different <laughs> please put in my blood yes okay. yeah 
which I think we never did, by the way. I think the, the, there is no extra blood in the US version. Not that people now try to get US version because there might be <laughs> it might be a more bloody word. I think we left it the same just for time reasons um, because that would have meant extra artwork and everything. So, yeah. So, no more blood, but no less goes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Desperados 3 also got quite some recognition in the modding scene. Hours of work have been poured into reworked levels, some of them completely rewriting the story and creating a new game out of the puzzle pieces of the original. Desperados.mod.io collects several dozen levels with rewrites, solo missions and fun new takes on the existing material. Considering the large number of existing mods, we decided to check out the second modded mission of Saxorad, a winner of the latest modding contest. It features a unique solo run with Doc McCoy and reworks the popular flagstone level in very interesting ways. We contacted the creator of A Night Out and asked him a few questions about what makes his mod stand out. The mission took two days to make with tools combining extended sheets, level editors from the community and runtime Unity editor. Lots of time was spent on playtesting, getting the timing of waypoints and the placement of enemies right so the flow would work and the level of difficulty would steadily increase throughout the mission. Doc was chosen as the solo mission character because his gameplay works for puzzles with groups of enemies, but he also has to take his time, which fits with the overall design of the mod. Also, his coat could be taken off to give him a unique look for his solo run. So you can see, a lot of fiddling and a lot of thought went into this mission and into the other ones that are available. <coughs> do you, and until today, do you have kind of your favorite level or, or yeah. your favorite scene from the game? Yeah, my favorite level is definitely, and again, I hope the fans won't shoot at me if I say the wrong level, but it must be the level 21, which is, I think they're re returning from the mine and getting back into this big city. And in the city, there are the bad guys, but there's also the cavalry that's trying to take over the city. So you're actually fighting two um, parties in that level. So you're in the upper left corner and need to get down to, to the train station, which I think is actually the train station that I've mentioned before, just on your way back. Um, and um, so the cavalry is on one side of the city and has conquered one side or one part of the city and the bad guys um, are in the other part and they're shooting at each other and now you need to kill some of the bad guys so the cavalry can go more north and then you can walk around the cavalry kill some of the cavalry so the bad guys can go south and you can you need to trick them out and, and play you know let them fight each other uh, this is also a scene which was a bit inspired by the good the bad and the ugly when they're also with the cavalry for a while and in that movie they need to destroy a bridge ultimately but for us it was kind of like playing with the cavalry and the bad guys and you're kind of like in the middle and this is definitely the level with the most enemies in one level and it's also one of the hardest but it's as there are so many enemies in that level there are so many different ways you can also solve this level which i really like about it so that's my favorite one i looked at all the levels again um, at all the level maps just from the layout and i think one thing that is unique with regards to Eagle's Nest is that except for one other level, which is the mine, which has a, sim a similar approach, but it's visually, it's great, but Eagle's Nest is just outstanding. I mean, that's the first thing. Visually, you look at this and this this kind of like has Spaghetti Western and Sergio Leone all over it, just, just, just from the look. And then the other thing that is unique to that level compared to the other levels is the other levels are, you go from left to le right, right to left or whatever, you're in a city, um, but it feels you're all, it's all on, on the same, level of hate while eagle's nest is more like a climb so it really feels like you're climbing a mountain so you're going not only inside this this castle or this this, this fortress but you also have to get up and you really need to get to to the to the top of of this uh, tower and i think this is a very special and unique approach and it feels so obviously rewarding and satisfying once you're on the top because for the other levels it, it left right right left there is there's also a way of progress but it's not as much in your face as it is with you climbing something up so it, it has a, a certain certain kind of like i guess i guess it, it's similar to the satisfaction if you climb a mountain actually so there's this top this peak you want to go and when you're up there you know what you've achieved that that might be one of the reasons um from a more game design analytic perspective why this one is so popular i think it's a mixture of many things um, mm -hmm. that also what i've said before it was one of the levels we had very early from the art 
but the actual design and where do we place the opponents and what do you actually do in that level we did later when we were more experienced with other levels so we could also play more with already all the learnings we had and how we best place different groups of enemies into different areas so also from a level design i think that one is very very strong let's talk a little bit about why we're talking about old influences new influences things that obviously have to carry over from one desperados game to the another and that is the eagle's nest which yeah. you which de so you decided to put in as a dlc so w was that kind of planned from the get-go if we do a dlc it has to be this level but or rather our take on this level mm, so we always want to have like a level um that's a homage to desperados one or is it like a desperados one map and we also have like baton rouge but i think that's something where it's not so obvious because the desperados maps they have a very different scale than we need because we adjusted a lot of things like how far the vision is and stuff like that so you could not like copy one to one a map and that's why it's not like super clear and also it's like way earlier so there's like stuff not built in baton rouge but that was like the first homage and also we had the eagle's nest at that point in mind and we we're like okay like one homage but then we decided not to do eagle's nest because it's also like there's so much around it like you would need to explain more why it's in there and how it's connected and it would not like fit very well in our storyline as well but then then we had it back in our heads that when we would do a DLC we want to do that because it's just this super iconic map and yeah and how did that turn out working on that how much did you have to tweak how much did you have to change with the changed mechanics and, and move things around was that a long process I think it was then and not so long process because at the point when you finished your game you know so much about your game that you know okay this would work this not this we have to adjust so we could be pretty straightforward obviously it needed a duration and all the interesting part is like the map is now there's eagle's nest and there's like it's just like one a quarter of the map <laughs> that we built so there's a lot around eagle's nest and like figuring that out and making that like kind of logical that it's still connected because i think the original eagle's nest is just in the desert and there would be no things around it but you need stuff to have proper gameplay in it so we had to build like a small old village or an old battlefield and that was rather challenging to have something where we would be okay it's still very convincing because we just need a larger map <laughs> because and that's where you see where it's very uh, different because like in the original one it works as a full like very long big map and in our game because of the scale it just it's like one quarter of a map <laughs> so <laughs> If you're watching this, you can win the smallest collector's edition in the whole Wild West. Or a normal Desperados collector's edition. Or the amazing original soundtrack on vinyl. Or amazing Desperados artworks from Displayed. To participate, go to desperadosgame.com and follow the instructions. You will fill out a very short Desperados survey form to participate in the raffles and maybe influence the future of the Desperados franchise. If you look at the soundtrack, I think there's something where worked very well when you like first listen to it it's like like most of the parts are like very uh guitar playing and you know like the tunes that's like the expectation is fulfilled when you listen to it but if you listen closer or if, as the songs develop there's always like synthesizers and stuff like that that would not be in the classical like western music and there and it's When you know it, it's pretty dominant, but when you don't know it, I think you just don't realize it in a way. But there's all the stuff that would make no real sense in the music, but that was a lot of fun, like bringing in, I don't know, like super techno bass drums in there, and then it still sounds like a Western. And 
<laughs> it sounds like a nice project. Just trying to, to, to look how far you can push it until people actually openly notice while playing the game. Okay. <laughs> and like all the tracks are developing differently and also that aspect is when you look at the, the scenarios, like the landscapes where you play in, we have this like the first scene is like super dusty, super classic and this second scene is then super green and flourishing and stuff and that's more like how modern westerns look like so that's those are like very like thoughtful decisions we made so old new <laughs> so like it's sometimes very obvious but also i think not so obvious because people don't think in that way about it so i mean testing is another thing um if you would ask me about one thing that i kind of like regret and I, that i would have done differently is the level uh, of difficulty okay. because um desperados one only has one level of difficulty so you cannot switch and we had one fixed QA, we had a couple of good QA team members, but we had not the luxury of changing the QA members all the time, but they knew the game from inside out and were there from the beginning until the end. And when you work like that, what obviously happens is that after having played a level for the 10th times, obviously everybody, including your QA, knows the game inside out. And what happens then is that to say, I can complete this game in 10 minutes, let's make it harder. Oh, it's still too easy, so let's make it harder. Because obviously, once you know all the secrets of the level, I mean, you can always compete every level in a speedrun manner. And so we made some of the levels, unfortunately, a bit too hard. And 21 is by far the, the hardest level of all of them. Um, so testing it already was a, was a kind of like a challenge. But then testing it and not making it impossible for somebody who's playing it for the first time was even a bigger challenge and i think with some level we did a better job and with other levels i must say every time i looked at new people playing the game for the first time i was like oh nah, maybe <laughs> <laughs> maybe and the sad thing is um it would have been very easy um to actually um, add a level of difficulty because I mean, everything was in a database and um, the behavior of all enemies, they were all in a database. So we could have just said, okay, on level easy, their line of sight is shorter and they t it's just taking longer for them to reload all these things that would have been for one code or maybe one week to, to add that. And we, th we, we thought, no, the game is fine as it is. Let's ship it. So that one extra week would have been very beneficial because I mean, the game got, great reviews but if there was one thing everybody was complaining if people complained it was the level of difficulty did you have a favorite character among, mm. among the crew my, my my favorite character um and i, I must uh, i did the voice recordings for the for the german version i also wrote most of the the dialogues actually um and I always played the German version and especially in the German version, I think I've played the English version, but I can't even say how well he is there. But in the German version, Doc is my favorite character because his voice um, and, and, and the punchlines he has, it's just, he's this very cynical Lee Van Cleef character and I just love him. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's great. Is there something that was kind of, this is my favorite character, this is my favorite aspect of the game, things that carry through now to the Desperados 3? Um, yeah, like some characters <laughs> have just made it to Desperados 3, obviously. Um, yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of Doc McCoy, like the sniping that's super iconic, also with the scope on your screen that's like, such a simple thing but it's so iconic and i love it so much and so that was always something where we're like okay i want to have that in any game like that what were the things that you were looking at or that you were reading watching to to yeah. kind of get that um yeah yeah the crispness uh, the the dialogue right yeah yeah, maybe a bit uh, because I also don't want to kind of like like, like claim uh, things here that, that were more kind of like a, a obviously a, a combined effort. So first of all, when um, going back to this, this zombie idea and when we kind of like talked to we as Infogram talked to Spellbound and say, look, guys, can we change uh, this into more spaghetti Western scenario? And they, like I said, they were completely on board right from the beginning. They already had 
at least 10, maybe even 12 levels. Um, at least from the art side, at least as scribbles. So they scribbled all the levels, obviously first made concept and kind of like already had decided on a lot of interesting scenarios. Like we'll have a city, we'll have a gold mine. This would be a great scenario. We need to get a train there. So they got all the inspiration from these different Westerns. So the first thing we had to come up with was actually the plot itself. So what will happen in the game? What, what happens to the gang and, and this whole thing with Sanchez and El Diablo and who is El Diablo? We didn't know who El Diablo was. In the uh, in the beginning, the idea was that Sanchez, who's now just a henchman of him, would turn out to be El Diablo. Um, this was all done together. So we were sitting together with Jean-Marc and the whole team at, at, at um, Spellbound. We were kind of like had uh, lo lots of meetings. We had a war room. And what we did is we always uh, posted all the different level concepts on the wall and tried to stand in front and say, okay, when in this level this happens, what could happen in this level? And how can we make a plot around it? So we kind of like first built the overall plot around the, especially the levels that were already there and the ideas for different levels, additional levels that Spellbound already had in mind. And so we kind of like, went back and forth okay now this level well no then this level needs to go here and they could go from here to here and so this was the first thing that we did and we always wanted um the the dialogues actually to be written by a, by a script writer i mean I, I i had some roots in writing before and i was working for a journalist as a journalist for a while and, and did some some books as well but i was kind of like a as a producer i don't have the time and b i let, let, let's find somebody who can do that and uh, we had a script writer but the thing is um, due to some bureaucracies and like I said during that time Infogram was was kind of like on a, on a, on a buying spree and they have had a lot of companies they just bought I couldn't get hold of anybody in, in the legal department at Infogram to just get a contract out to the script writer and a script writer I was like no worries you're getting paid we're a big company but the script writer because in TV it seems to be you need to be very careful obviously or in movies so he said I will not start without us a contract which is fair enough um but uh we couldn't get him a contract in time and we had already booked uh, the, the studio for the voice recordings <laughs> and i was like okay you know what guys i will write it so i wrote down the the, the germ so actually for that game we did the german voice recordings first uh which again I, <laughs> it is another great story i have to tell you in a second um which caused another issue then um, so I wrote the text, but obviously in, in close co collaboration again, especially with Sean Mark and everybody. Uh, but I did the main writing for all the dialogues. The story and setting were heavily influenced by classic spaghetti western movies with Clint Eastwood and also by 80s action films like Lethal Weapon or Big Trouble in Little China and modern westerns such as Sam Raimi's The Quick and the Dead. But there were quite a few more movie Easter eggs to be found. Uh, and there's also, I mean, this famous scene, um, this, this Easter egg with dogs in the swamp where he kind of like does his Jedi trick uh, with the boat coming out of the swamp. Um, and the thing, the problem was, though, um, so for the cutscenes that you see in the game for this high-res renderings, um, we had to do, it's like when, when they do, for example, a Pixar movie, that's also what they do there. They first do the, the voice recordings and, and film the actors, Tom Hanks, when he's doing his, his kind of like making his text or speaking his text. And then they take the lip movings and take that for, for the movie, then the Pixar movies and animate the characters. So it fits the, the lip moving of, of the text that is spoken. And we did the same for the... Um, text for the cutscene. So when John Cooper talks, we did the voice recordings first, filmed the actor and the graphic studio did the lip syncs. What we didn't consider is we did the German text, which was stupid because German is way longer than English. And any German voice actor is used to getting English films and he's dubbing it. And then he cuts out lines or speaks faster. So it always fits the English. But the English actors, A, weren't used to dub German lips movings. And B, the text was just too long. They said, guys, we don't have that many words to fill in the text here. So <laughs> it still fits to the lip movings. And never again, I did uh, afterwards for any other game, I worked on the, the German voice recordings first to do the lip syncs because that was a very stupid idea idea yeah so if in the english version the dubbing sometimes is not looking good that's on me <laughs> oh a pair that's very nice indeed go oh, hang it hmm <laughs> uh oh two pairs a pair of kings and a pair of aces talking about the western stories 
um, Desperate as One was very, very much influenced by spaghetti westerns where you have basically direct takes on scenes from Once Upon a Time in the West and the good and, and, and the bad and the ugly. So when you started working on the game, were there like movie nights at Mimi Me Studios or did you just work off what you already had absorbed? Um, no, like... We did our research and we also watched those movies before, like all the spaghetti stuff. And we also looked at the new Western influences there and like not too many, but it, like it had a small peak and something like Westworld is pretty cool. And another take, a very strange take on it. But uh, we looked at all those and we had an, yeah, our design goal was kind of having like the old and the new. We it was a, like a, in a lot of aspects we had like old and new we want to combine it and make something me 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 unique out of it i think now in the end we're a bit more leaning towards the old than the new stuff i think it's still like now looking at it more the classic came through in the game but in all the aspects we try to have like modern things in it let's talk a little bit about the difficulty levels or working difficulty levels, because talking to Ralph about the design for Desperados 1, he said the one thing that he was kind of sad about that they didn't manage was to tweak the difficulty or put at different levels. So did you kind of find yourself confronted with the same problems to gauge how new players would approach this and how hard it would be for them? Yeah, so that was also a learning, like from shadow tactics that we were like okay we, we want to improve on that aspect we want to make it easier in a way and yeah the only way to make this like substantial working is that you have to like really tweak the enemy setups like the puzzles and that is a lot of work um but it was that was very clear from the beginning that we really want to do that and put in that extra effort and I think also there we have a learning now that when you know what to tweak, it's then getting easier to bring in those difficulty levels. So in the beginning, it was very hard to figure out what it means or at what point you would like completely make a puzzle, like not a puzzle anymore, but like mm -hmm. you just click everybody that and that's it. And there's no challenge because it is only fun if there's a challenge and to know at what point that breaks and there's no challenge anymore. That was a point we have to like really figure out. But when we got a feeling for that, it worked pretty well, I would say. Okay. So there, was there ever a point where you realized talking to talking with testers, talking with QA, that at some point you had built something that for most people was uncrackable or things like that? Yeah. So... <laughs> The usual process most of the time was um, when you like start or a designer starts to build a level and you first play it, that's w that it is way too hard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But uh, also with the experience, they were getting like very much better at that. But it's when you know, when you build a puzzle, you always know the solution and it's very hard to abstract or think in a way of the player not knowing the things and some things that you think in the first they are so obviously that for one player uh, they just look at it and then they just don't see it and then it's becoming super hard and if they like oh that would be the one thing then it's super easy but also we learned that throughout the map um, every player Every, nearly every player has that moment at some point. Mm. So there's always this like one, one puzzle would be super hard for somebody, even if it's not intended, because like something where we thought is like the sub, super obvious solution or approach would not be like in their mind at the time. So, but then once they have cool the light because, bulb moment, it, yeah, it goes smoothly. Okay. So, But that, that helps because you always know, okay, at some point there will be a challenge in for the player. So we could be more like say, okay, let's make it 
throughout a bit easier because that those moments will happen anyways but on hard we would like force them in <laughs> <laughs> i'm for desperado 3 I'm, I'm i'm mainly a fan who played the game through and and kind of like yeah with, with very warm feelings had a very great time I think the only thing I must say, but see, that's the thing. Uh, even on hard for me, it's too easy, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not the benchmark here, obviously. So. No. Do you remember other, other moments during production working with, with Spellbound where things just didn't work out or where things suddenly worked out in a different way, in a surprising way? Things that, that seem like they are absolutely meant to be in the final game, but they were kind of just coincidence or serendipity <coughs> let me think about this i think i mean generally until today and i'm i mean i'm still I, i'm now almost in my 30th years of, of game development it was still one of the best uh, developments i've ever been kind of like involved with regards to the collaboration and i mean it's 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 always kind of like the ideal that the publisher and the developer working in the same direction and running in the same direction and share the same vision. I mean, there's always on the way, there's sometimes struggle and, and sometimes there are things somebody wants to do differently, uh, either on one side or the other. But that was one of the smoothest sailing I've, I've really ever been into. I mean, you can already tell from the, it's also, I'd say even the game that was most on time budget and quality ever and so we signed the contract like i said in late uh 99 and the original plan was to ship it in late 2000 so one year later for the christmas business but already when we signed the contract um it was infogram actually who said look guys we really believe in this title and we think you should spend some more time so we give you four extra months and we even pay for it so we make this an easter release not a christmas release and that came from infogram usually it's the developer who asks for more time or more money uh, and obviously the developer said sure that that sounds awesome uh, we gladly take the money um, and then it was the easter release so they, they released it on time um, and it came out really on time with the plan scope with all the 25 levels that were planned um, <clears throat> there were some hiccups along the way, mostly when it came, um, I've, I've, but, but that's more on the natural side. It was mostly like marketing when sometimes some ads were produced in France and in, uh, Spellbound was looking at it and they weren't really happy with what, what came out of that. And then there were some back and forth on that. But that was all kind of like that there wasn't really that much there was one thing and i mentioned it that wasn't that well um which was the fact that like i said uh, we had uh, two dedicated tester at spellbound for the game but um the publisher always also does his own QA as well. So as a publisher, I mean, no matter what, what you get from a developer, and even if he tells you, yeah, we tested it inside out, there are no bugs. You obviously want to check it again and maybe also give some additional feedback. The, one of the problems there was um, that there was nobody in the um, QA department who was familiar with um, strategy games or tactic games. Mm -hmm. So The, the feedback we got there sometimes was very kind of like, yeah, can you take out all, all, all more or less the, the strategy elements and make it more an adventure game? And we were like kind of, no, this is not the game we're, we're going to do. Because obviously the, the DNA and the roots, and if you look in, uh, into what, what Infogram did mostly, games like Alone in the Dark, they were way more in another genre. So this was really their first strategy game. So that was sometimes a bit bumpy. But again, it was on a level where I'd say, I mean, if, if I've, I've seen way worse for, for, for other games, we can shed some light on this here uh, because many fans out there might be aware with the legendary web episodes. Um, and if not, so that was the idea that after the game was released, um, Infogram wanted to release six more levels or, or what they call web episodes because they wanted to release it only in the web. So that was their first kind of like attempt to test out this, this, this magic new thing called the internet um, and infogram uh, sorry spellbound actually even um, produced those levels some of them actually then later made it into at least from the level design into desperados 2 uh, like the fort um, but uh, they made all the levels but infogram never managed unfortunately to get these out why that was i 
don't know to be honest because that was after uh, I left um, Infogram. So like I said, I, I left after the game, the original game was released and when Spellbound just started on these webisodes. So ultimately they produced six additional levels but they never saw the day of light and the like i said the the, the, the funny story behind that is that um bruno bonnell who was the um, ceo of infogram back in the days so a bit like the if you what if you more is to to be soft he was this charismatic leader of infogram um once visited us in, in, in our office, the Infogram office in, in, in Germany, when we were working on the game, me and my associate producer, uh, and said, oh, I love this game. I've already heard so much good about it. And I want you guys to make it a um, online game. And we were like, this is a single player. It doesn't even have a multiplayer modus. How do you want to make it an online game? Um, and he said, no, no, the internet will be the next big thing, which he was absolutely right about it. Um, and that was, 2000. So it's it's funny. Bruno back in 2000 said in the future, and he called that nomad, nomadic gaming. We will work. Uh, sorry, we will play with our watches. We will play with our phones. We will have displays even on refrigerators that are linked to the internet, and you can even play on these. And we were just like, this guy is kind of like a <laughs> bit crazy, <laughs> but he was absolutely right. I mean, it was. 10 years too early, but hey, I mean, that, that shows what, what kind of a visionary he was. But nevertheless, he wanted us to make this, it, it turn Desperados into an um, online game. And we were like, not going to happen, sorry. And that's when we came up with this idea, but maybe we can do these webisodes and you can just release them into the internet. And he said, yeah, that's a great idea. And, and he was happy. And that, that's how that <laughs> kind of like was, that, that, that idea was born. Um, but it never actually then panned out. So they, they, those levels are just lost. They, they are the lost them. levels. Yes, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then one, one last thing I have here is about what was supposed to be kind of a spin-off, Hell Dorado. Yeah. If you know anything about it, how that game came to be and why it's actually not a Desperados game, or at least not officially. Yeah. Um, Again, for that one, I'm even also in the credits, but I think the only thing I did for Hell Dorado was the voice recordings. Mm -hmm. And I was booked directly by Spellbound, if I remember correctly. Or was I booked by DTP? I can't tell you anymore. But what I know about it is that um, Spellbound wanted to do another game after that. They already had some ideas. And like I said, they were, they were happy with some things in Desperados 2, but they also agreed that other things weren't working out that well. And they wanted to take these learnings and just make a better game, either a Desperados 2.5 or a huge add-on that you could sell maybe even for full price or whatever. Um, and so they, and they, I think even they had some level material already that didn't make it in Desperados 2, but I might be wrong on that, that part. But um, they reached out to uh, Infogram slash Atari and said, we want to work on another game because, like I said, they still own the brand, um, the Desperados brand. But uh, Infogram wasn't too interested in that. And they were already, I mean, one of the reasons actually uh, why I left Infogram after Desperados was that already back then, um, Bruno Bonnell, the, the, the CEO, announced that they would like to focus more on console games in the future and kind of like get rid of the PC market. And for me, as I was working in strategy games, I was kind of like, I don't believe in strategy games on console. So I'd rather love to continue working in PC games. And that's why I changed and after desperados 2 it was even more clear so infogram was cutting all of its roots to pc gaming and so it didn't have any interest but the thing is that the contract was i think um made in a way that infogram owned the name desperados but they did not own the name for the heroes so john cooper kate o'hara all the heroes um they were kind of like copyright trademark whatever by by spellbound so they owned the rights to the to the heroes they created so the only thing they couldn't do was to make a desperados 3 but they could make a game whatever and then use the heroes for that and so they pitched it to a german publisher which was dtp up in hamburg also the don't exist anymore unfortunately these days but they were also kind of like a, a medium-sized publisher uh, back in the mid 2000s and they signed it um and then they they made it and like i said i'm i think i only did the voice recordings there for that one 
um, because I did the voice recordings for Desperados 1 and 2 and I knew the voice actors and, and how to direct them and everything. So they just hired me for that one. But other than that, I think I have not many routes to Hell Dorado. Yeah. But, but that, okay. So it, it was basically a Desperados game and all but the Desperados yeah. game. Yeah. So, so, okay. so if, you're, if you're out for more Desperados fun and you have never heard of that game before, check it out. I think it's definitely the be better Desperados 2. It's a bit shorter. And I think one, in, in my opinion, main flaw it has, but this is more just from a game design perspective, but it starts with a very dark and rainy level. And from a game design perspective, you should always start with something more bright and easy and, and, and lighthearted uh, because it, it puts you right from the beginning in a very depressed mode, which I found <laughs> weird back in the day. But the game, uh, like I said, they took all the learnings from Desperados too. So it, with regards to the level design and the balancing and everything, I think Caldorado personally, I think is way better than Desperados too. But that's my personal opinion. If you're watching this, you can win the smallest collector's edition in the whole Wild West or a normal Desperados collector's edition or the amazing original soundtrack on vinyl, or amazing Desperados artworks from this plate. To participate, go to desperadosgame.com and follow the instructions. You will fill out a very short Desperados survey form to participate in the raffles and maybe influence the future of the Desperados franchise. And have you also been aware of, of the things that kind of happened around the game, thing, things like um, the extra special edition with tiny dioramas or things like the role-playing game so how does that feel to have all these these add-ons basically that always gives you the feel that whoa this is big <laughs> 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 because it's not just the game it grows like on the sides and like one thing i have to point out is like the diorama trailer have you seen that one yeah i love that one so much i don't know it was I'm a bit sad because it did not get the attention I think it would deserve. Um, maybe that's because of the timing and we had a lot of trailers there. And also it's it's not as like super flashy. It's more like it's kind of like a piece of art, I would say. It's more like you watch it and you just enjoy it. And But I think it just perfectly hits the mood and it's so well crafted. Like it's impressive. You, you've looked at and you've played Desperados 3 and you've looked at what me, me, me have done so you're kind of happy with the legacy I'm, I'm the, the happiest man I could be with, with that game I mean I know the, the guys quite well uh, and when they did the first game um, or the first tactic game not the first game um the Shogun game, mm -hmm. um, I already well consulted is, is already too much. But um, as I knew them before, even back when they were students, uh, I went to their office several times and already back then pretty much gave them all the insights I'm, I'm, I'm giving you now on what we did in Desperados, learnings we had, also showed them some level level designs and stuff like that. Uh, so I already did that for the first game and then I did that again for uh, Desperados 3 in the very beginning, kind of like tell them again, okay, what were our ideas? But I've already always told them, um, this game is 20 years ago and we tried to make this kind of game. Today I would make so many 
things differently also from the storytelling perspective and and things we did there things that might be even from a political correctness i'd say looking at that today that's that's close to being a bit cringy um take the game and make it your legacy make whatever you want out of that and they did and i'm, I'm happy that they still st st stuck to so so many things that i think were, were so they, they just took the best of what 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 desperados was and, and just made it better so I'm, i'm very happy i think they even gave me uh, credits thanks for that that that's already too much i think a special thanks or something looking back now that Desperados 3 is, is done and now celebrating kind of the birthday of the whole series of games. Um, how happy are you with, with what you turned in, with what you did? Is, is, is there pride in kind of having revived not a genre, but also kind of a series of games that you grew up with? Definitely. <laughs> no, we, we are super happy with the results and the perception and everything around it. And like so much feedback from the fans and that they're so happy that we really like valued that ip and made it something that's where they would say okay that's a desperatus how i could have imagined it and that's that's a honor and such an achievement to have that delivered no like there's like not a single point where we're not like ah <laughs> we're not happy about it that's really cool mm -hmm.